Kaylee McEnany, so great to see you again. Glad to have you on the Will Kane podcast. Um, and it's been fun catching up with you over the past couple of months now that we're together at Fox News. Our relationship goes back over a decade, I would say, to when yep. we were both on The Blaze. And I want to talk to you about that, Kaylee. And I want to talk to you about your time at CNN. And I want to talk to you about your time as White House press secretary. But I think I'd like to start today where everyone's mind is. We are right on the eve of midterm elections. I just want to see where you are. You're an astute political observer. And I think everybody's wondering what's going to happen. So what is your 30,000 foot view of what happens here at the midterms? Well, great to join you, Will. Um, I think this is going to be a total and complete wave election. Um, Look, I I obviously support the Republican Party, but I'm not just saying that for that reason. Um, Every morning I, I read the numbers and increasingly they are becoming devastating for Democrats. When you see in Washington state a a race there that is within single digits with an incumbent like Patty Murray, who might very well lose to Tiffany Smiley. When you look at New Hampshire, new polling out that shows Don Boldick there ahead um, in a state that we're supposed to lose. I think we win the Senate, likely 52, maybe 53. Nevada, another one where there's supposed to be this Latino wave towards Democrats. But it looks like what was happening in Miami-Dade County and South Texas, and now Nevada, Latinos coming to the Republican Party, and perhaps a pickup there as well. So I think 52, 53 seats in the Senate. I think at least 25 seats in the House, 25 seat majority could be more. And some some real stellar governor outcomes, perhaps a Republican governor in Oregon. It's a, a three way race, but who would have thought? Um, When the polling is that close in blue states, um, that is the point at which Democrats really need to worry, because I think Republicans are even underestimated in some of the polling. So I want to dive into a few of those particular states and a few of those particular races. But if it is as resounding as you expect, if it is 53 seats in the Senate, a clear win in the House and I like the way you described the gubernatorial races, races that define perhaps some future stars of the Republican Party. If that is the outcome, why did that happen to Democrats? Because they ignored the top issue, um, economy, inflation, and then second to that, crime. Um, It was a really interesting write-up in Politico Playbook this week. Um, And and they're the Washington insiders. They don't always see everything right. In fact, I would characterize it as probably an an elitist point of view and that they're not on the ground talking to people. But they did get one thing right, and it was this. They said Democrats have been essentially throwing everything at the wall. We've heard blood red MAGA speech from Biden um, and a democracy, threat to democracy speech at Union Station. Uh, We've heard abortion. Remember, they were apoplectic about that. Um, And then we've we've heard all sorts of different things, but a total and complete ignoring of the economy, whereas they contrasted that with Republicans. And they said even down to House congressional races where people get local, the message has been consistent economy. We're going to fix inflation, bring down gas prices as much as we can with the Democrat president and crime. We want your children to be safe on the streets. Every race from from J.D. Vance in Ohio to a local House race has been very clear on the theme. With Democrats, there's no theme. It's abortion. It's democracy. It's lying about Social Security. And um, that inconsistency is something voters can see. You know, Kelly, I'm going to give you some of my opinion here now for just a moment. I want to see what your thoughts are on this. You know, I feel like. The Democratic machine. And when I say the Democratic machine, I'm not limiting that to the political apparatus, but also its support within culture and within the media has been so invested in the culture or the cult of personality for Mm -hmm. so long that it has allowed them to sort of let the muscle atrophy of policy. If you think about Democratic politicians, the last real big policy push that I feel like I truly remember was for Obamacare. Um, definitive, this is what we stand for, and this is how we propose to make your life better. Whether or not they were right or wrong, that was their belief, and they pushed forward a policy perspective. But Obama eventually became a celebrity. Trump was a testament in many things, but I think you and I would both agree that the coverage around Trump was about personality. It was about the reality show of Donald Trump. 
And I think what has happened here is when it's time to contest an election, we'll call it just these midterms in 2022, they reverted to those ideas and those plays and those character dramas and even those issues, abortion, that are somewhat abstract and removed from the everyday life of Americans. And so what they're confronted with now, and I ask you what you think is most important, I happen to agree, when they're confronted with now real things like crime and the economy, they're just not equipped. They're, they're not equipped. And you know what makes me wonder, Kaylee? If you're right and the election turns out the way you predict, are they capable of learning that lesson and changing course? No, they're not. I think your analysis is spot on. Um, there's a unilateral obsession with Donald Trump. That is their animating policy. Um, I would say abortion is is another one. And when you think about when you sit down at your kitchen table, it's really very simple, Will. When, it, when you think about politics, very simple. When you sit around your table, like, look, my husband and I, were aberrations. We talk about John Fetterman. We talk about the races. I'm, I'm a political person by nature. It's what I do. But the, the average family in this country who's not working in media, who's not working in politics, who's not in D.C. or New York City, um, they're talking about how can they afford groceries? How can they afford gas? Worries about what their kids are learning at school. These are the things they are talking about. They are not sitting there each night, as the women on The View do, talking about Donald Trump and dressing their children up as toilets with documents going down them, as we saw in one of the latest episodes of The View. It's just not what Americans are doing. But I, I... don't think they have the capability to separate themselves from Trump. And we've seen this with DeSantis, the freak out of DeSantis going on the stage with Luke Bryan. He's included in this. So if Trump throws his hat in in 24, which I suspect he will, if DeSantis does, which I suspect he will, perhaps Carrie Lake may be a VP candidate, the heads will explode as they always have, and they will divert to that same personality playbook you described. Yes. I don't think they can resist it, but it will backfire. Yes, I think you're exactly right. I think I don't believe they will. What not they are capable of. I don't believe they will learn the lessons of a midterm election correction. I think that the 2024 presidential election will be about personality. That's obviously the case if it's Donald Trump. But to your point, it will also be the case if it were Ron DeSantis. It will also be the case if it were Carrie Lake, because that is the way they have seen the world. And that is the way they have fought for well over a decade now through the prism characters not character but characters in a larger political drama let's use this opportunity then to start talking about a few of those characters who will be center stage here at the midterms and possibly beyond um and ones that i'm interested in let's let's start with arizona let's start with carrie lake a do you think she will win in her bid for governor in arizona and b what do you think is the political future of carrie lake So I I think she's going to win Um, the public polling. You know, there's been polls showing her head by double digits. There have been some that have shown it as small, single digits. Um, I know Carrie Lake's internals likely show a tremendous victory because she's out there campaigning for other candidates in other states. So she feels comfortable enough to do that, lending my belief to the fact that it will be maybe not double digits. But I do think she will win by a few points because she's been bold. She's been unequivocal. And she took a lesson from the Trump playbook, which was authenticity. Um, when you watch her, you know, look, she's a she's a fighter. She fought the media, much like, you know, I, I did at the podium. Um, but voters don't trust the media and, and they trust someone who will authentically put themselves out there, who is the same candidate in the primary as they are in the general. And make no mistake, Carrie Lake, what she said in the primary, she's saying in the general. Yeah. And that kind of authenticity rings true. And it's it's really paying off. I think she's a potential future vice presidential nominee. You know, you look around the party. A lot of people say it should be a, a woman as the VP nominee um, with either Trump, DeSantis, whoever it may be. Those are the top two in any given poll. Um, and I think when you look around women in this country in public office, the name that comes to mind is Carrie Lake. Um, so I, I, I get that she's a first term governor, um, but she's exhibited the ability to handle the media in a particularly effective way. And um, I think watching her go toe to toe with Kamala would be something. I don't think, though, she'll run for vice president. I don't know, Kaylee. I've heard her address questions about 2024, and maybe I'm putting a lot of stock in her authenticity. She is categorically dismissive. Look, as a politician would need to be if you're running for governor in 2022, but she is categorically dismissive about the job she's applying for and seeing that job through at least a term. 
I don't know. I guess I would be one person a little surprised if within two years she immediately moved on to the national stage. I think it's hard to turn down. Um, I also think when you're silent on the issue, because DeSantis was pressed on, you know, will you be there four years as governor? And he was silent on it. And I I respected that because it was an honest silence. And you could very much read into that silence that DeSantis will likely run in 2024. Uh, But that silence was used to suggest he would only be in office for the next, you know, two years and then would turn his mind to a presidential bid. So I personally think she couldn't turn it down. How could you? Um, but, But maybe you're right. You could very well be right on that, Will. So let me ask about Arizona, and I'm going to pair it with Ohio. So Blake Masters in Arizona, uh, running against incumbent Mark Kelly, not with a lot of support from establishment Republicans, and J.D. Vance in Ohio. I find these two races in particularly intriguing because I do think these two individuals represent a new direction for the Republican Party. And so I'm very curious if you think that's going to be a direction embraced by Arizona and Ohio. I think so. And and again, you know, it goes back to the theme of um, you mentioned the establishment not, not supporting these candidates. We were told we had such terrible candidates. You know, how dare you elect Blake Masters, nominate yeah. him um, and Carrie Lake and J.D. Vance. And as it turns out, these authentic candidates who are conservative through and through, who are you're right, not the typical mold, Blake Masters, not the typical mold. Um, are prevailing and doing quite well. And Blake Masters, you have the libertarian candidate who's dropped out. That's probably two to six percentage points that could go his way and it was likely be enough of a tailwind just to put him right over the top. J.D. Vance, a former author, Hillbilly Elegy, um, who's just a working class guy himself who who made it big, but made it big through hard work and dedication. Um, it shows him ahead in nearly every poll that I've looked at. So I think definitely J.D. Vance is going to win. Blake Masters, he's right there toddling on the edge, but you've got that libertarian vote now. Does Dr. Oz beat John Fetterman? It's, you know, I'll say this, and I think that it's something that Dr. Oz would have to look long in the mirror about. But if he loses to John Fetterman, what a statement. I I mean, you couldn't make it easier. I mean, the guy literally can't talk. Um, Does that is that enough? I can't believe I'm asking that question. Is it enough (laughs) that your opponent can't talk for Dr. Oz to win in Pennsylvania? (laughs) I mean, we elected a guy from a basement that couldn't talk. And granted, the circumstances were different. We had COVID-19 at the time, and it allowed Joe Biden to stay in the basement. Um, John Fetterman hasn't been able to stay in the basement. It's been evident to anyone who watched the debate um, that he has some issues that would be very hard to deal with in the Senate. But look, that's the probably hardest race at this point to win. I mean, you even see Herschel Walker ahead in Georgia. Um, Oz, it's it's been consistently a few points behind, um, though recently one or two points up, but it's so close, so on the margin. But to your point, Will, it is so difficult for me to believe that someone as progressive as John Fetterman, who has literally let multiple, not just one, voted to let multiple people who have killed other people with a pair of scissors, stabbed one person 26 times in one case, that this man would be someone who could be elected, probably outside of Mandela Barnes, the most progressive candidate that has been nominated in this country. It is very hard for me to believe he can prevail, but it's, the I will say, the race that I'm most concerned about at this very moment. That's the one you're most concerned about, Pennsylvania. I think so. You, you've seen Oz creep up, but, but it's just so close and so on the margin. Okay, I want to come back to a few more predictions with you in in, in just a moment, but I was excited to kind of go in this direction with you. Um, You know, I I remember I texted you at some point, and I don't really know um, when it was. It may be after you joined Fox. I don't think I ever communicated with you when you were in the White House. I was doing sports at ESPN. And, you know, for the audience, um, and the audience that listens to the Will Kane podcast probably knows this, um, but Kaylee, and for those that don't, I really, truly, honestly can say something honest about myself in this respect in that I don't give gratuitous compliments. I just have an instinctual inability to offer up a fake compliment. Uh, My famous story on that is I had this beautiful Kaylee Doberman. I lived in New York City. He'd lived with me in Montana, Hawaii, Texas, and I would take him to the Central Park where it was leash free. And people, oh, your dog is so beautiful. And, you know, the nice and cordial and like socially graceful thing to do is go, eh, your dog's beautiful as well. I can't do it unless their dog is actually beautiful. I just can't lie. Good for you. Even if it's a compliment. Um, 
I sent you a text saying how impressed I was with the way that you handled your job um, as White House press secretary. And I, it's inextricable for me, Kaylee, from probably the first time I met you. And I was working on a show called uh, Real News at the Blaze. It was a panel yep. show, a table, like four or five people sitting around. You were really young. I, I don't even know if you you might have still been in law school. I'm not sure. Um, before law school, I think. So, was it before yeah, law I was school? Young. Yes. Yep. Okay. Here's what I remember, Kaylee. The notes. You had so many notes, so much paper, so many things you'd written down. And I was like, I don't know if this is going to go very well. Because now that you've done television, you know it's like <laughs> you don't have time to sit here and go through your notes and look down. You barely have a chance to look down at something yep. you've written. And you had so much. And I was like, oh, this girl is very prepared. That is That much is true. But it, I'll be real with you, Kaylee. At that moment, I didn't know where you're, I didn't, I don't know that I could have predicted the success, forget success. I don't know that I could have predicted the aptitude and absolute excellence with which you executed your job. Thank you. Well, first of all, that compliment means a whole lot more now that I know it wasn't gratuitous. <laughs> but <laughs> it's that's, never gratuitous. That's awesome. Yeah, you know, I, I'm an over-preparer, and, and I'm an over-preparer not because I have to, but because I love to. And I was this very... I, I'm going to say strange child in that I did not grow up in a political family. They they had political views. They are conservative. We talked about politics occasionally at the dinner table, but I didn't grow up in a political family, but I loved politics. It was innate. I listened to Rush Limbaugh in my dad's truck. I, I, I There was something about him I found so attractive, his passion. Um, I was a Rush baby. I was cheering for Bob Dole on the playground when I was you know, eight years old, um, which is crazy, 1996 election. I mean, I my point with all of this is I was passionate and had this fire within me that I couldn't get enough, be it in the White House, preparing for that job at the podium. One of the things you have to do and one of the things you have to love is policy. And I thought it was the coolest thing in the world I could call the secretary of HHS, the, uh, you know, the CDC director, I could call DHS secretary and ask them for their data and their numbers and their graphs and pour through it myself as a primary source. So rather than having talking points put in front of me, I like to make the talking points. I like to do the research. And mm. I think that passion from a young girl carried with me through through the blaze um, and into the White House, it makes a difference. So uh, let's can we dig into that for a moment? Because I really am fascinated. So what you did so well, and this is how you know it, it wasn't gratuitous. And my, as the older I get, the worse the worse is my memory. But what you did so well is actually something that I have spent some time here complimenting Carrie Lake, and, and that is um, you. You clearly understand how to listen to a question, and here's what's interesting, and directly respond to the question that is asked, which is a very, very powerful thing to do because in that process, you know what presumptions were baked into the question, what's the false mm -hmm. predicate. What I mean by that is, quote-unquote, journalists bake opinion into something that looks like an objective question and just because there's a question mark at the end of a statement doesn't actually make it a question you have to accept at face value. And you would, you would, you know, dissect it and take it apart for what it truly is. But you had all this research at your disposal. Did you know when you were in the room before you walked into the, the White House briefing room, did you have some sense every time, like, okay, I can't anticipate that. NBC News wants to talk about this, and they'll probably ask it this way. Did you like? Did you game plan that stuff in your head? Did you? How do? How do you? You were not. You were clearly prepared, but there's a difference between having notes, right, and doing that preparation, yep. and playing the game. There, there's a. Di I'm, when I say playing the game, I'm drawing a sports analogy. You have to be in the moment, right? You can't be in your notes. And so, I just yep. was curious about the preparation that made you capable of living in the moment of the questions that are being asked in real time. Yes. Um, so excellent point. Um, you know, for, for me, I would sit in my office, I would do personal study, come up with the points myself, which helps, you know, when, when it's not just a team developing the binder, I certainly had great folks who helped me, but I did it myself um, for a lot of the time, but I had two amazing advisors, Chad Gilmartin and Julia Hahn, and we would sit for 
hours upon hours upon hours in my office going down every possible rabbit hole. Really? How will they ask this question? Yes, we would hours. Um, and, and how would they ask this question? And we would oftentimes nail down to the hardest possible question. We were always going to be truthful at the podium, but the one that would be hardest for us to answer. Um, and, and, you know, how can we answer this in a truthful way with facts a very tough question that that puts us in a bad spot. And we were always able to find that question. And that question was never asked. I can really? tell you every time I walked in knowing the hardest question, they never asked it. it so was whatever always every day you came up steps. with, here's my toughest question. Not once did someone actually ask your toughest question? Not not once, unless it was the low blow personal um you sent out a tweet saying COVID will never come here when that's what Fauci was saying. You know, how could you say that before you were press secretary? Unless it was something personal like that, um, they never asked the hardest question, which made it very easy. In fact, they usually did not bring the transcript of the part of the quotes they were referencing from the president. Oh. So when I would challenge them, they wouldn't even have the full quote from the president. Right. So they never found the question that was hardest. And so you're conducting like a mock trial, almost a, a mock yep, press conference exactly. in the background. So you're you're not seeing pitches you hadn't considered ahead of time. Exactly. Uh, the only is time there was something that I, I wouldn't have seen. I I say I think it is rare. Um, I do. I mean, there would be the occasional foreign policy question about you know something happening that was not on our radar that I'd have to say I'll get back to you on. Um, but I do think that because you're a Republican press secretary and a def- posture where they're putting you on defense. They're trying to, and you have to move to offense. You're uniquely uh, forced to prep in a way that I don't think Jen Psaki had to. I don't think Kareem Jean-Pierre has had to um, because for them, I do think they're, they're probably just predicting the surface level questions. That's all they have to do. But right. as a Republican press secretary, me, Sarah, whoever stood at that podium, um, even going back prior to Trump, I, you're forced to dig a little bit deeper. Um, and in doing so, it, it makes you more prepared. So I, I don't I'm not doing this for the gossip of it. I, I'm I'm really curious of your analysis. Like Saki was clearly better at this job than Kareem Jean-Pierre, mm-hmm. in my estimation. Um, she is better. When you see people up there, and I don't want you to, I'm not going to put you in a position where you need to pass, you know, where you're critiquing or offering your judgment on our colleagues, you know, Dana or whoever else has sat in that seat. It's a hard seat and it's different for every administration and no every doubt. decade. Um, so let's just stick with Saki and Karine Jean Pierre. Like when you see that, like, do you see differences in preparation? Do you see differences in just ability? What do you see? Yeah. You know, I see, you know, with with Karine Jean-Pierre, there have been times she's been asked about something policy wise um, and hasn't had a good response or hasn't said the, the administration's point on it. Uh, rarely. And, and I think, like I said, you have to have a love for public policy. I don't know if she does or doesn't. But judging by some of the answers she's given, um, it doesn't appear to me that she's making those calls to department heads looking at the primary material herself. And maybe she is. Um, but it doesn't appear to me that that's the case. Um, with Jen Psaki, it seemed that she she did dig a little bit into, into policy. Um, but what I will say for both of them is I think the playing fields are entirely different in that um, optics matter a lot. And when you're standing at that podium and you're at the microphone and the press gives you the grace, as they should give any press secretary, of giving you a chance to respond, um, that goes a long way in terms of optically how the public perceives what you're doing versus you're giving an answer and someone shouts you down mid-answer. Another reporter screams from the back of the room. There were times they would scream in unison at me, at Sarah. (laughs) There's a Playboy reporter at the back of the room who would shout every time I would leave and his question would inevitably become a headline um, as yeah. I'm walking off, not having a chance to respond. So my point is the dynamic was different for them. And I think it makes it much easier to um, succeed in the public eye when you don't have that that kind of hostile dynamic. Um, but it is a tough job. And, you know, I give credit to Kareem Jean-Pierre for standing up there every day, to Jen Psaki standing up there every day. It's it's a tough job, um, and it's you gotta you gotta love it. You've gotta love well, it. Well, I also like how you describe the different playing field because really, Saki and Karine Jean Pierre really only have to anticipate an adversarial question, or at least a reliably adversarial question from Peter Ducey. As you point out, they're just not. I mean, 
whatever the toughest question is, they're not even coming within rings of levels of whatever that question, unless it's coming right. from Peter Ducey, unless it's coming from Peter yes. Ducey. Um, there you go. Otherwise, they, they don't have to worry that they're going to field that question. And they can control how many times they call upon Peter as, as well. Um, mm-hmm. So let me ask you about a different part of your career. That, and I'm curious if this was a good training ground for you. And it's something you and I share in common. Before I came to Fox, I had worked, we both worked, you and I, at different times at CNN, um, which for me wasn't vastly, vastly different than my experience at ESPN, which means I was almost, through most of my career before joining Fox, I was almost in, what do they call it in wrestling? Um, Do they call that a, uh, a battle royale? I can't, I'm not a huge wrestling fan. You know, like where it's, I'm in a ring and everybody else is my opponent. I have to fight everybody, yeah. right? It's not a one-on-one fight. So I'm on a panel with four people and me, right? And those three other people, four other people, they all agree. And I'm the outlier, right? It doesn't matter if it was CNN or ESPN. And I actually liked it, Kaylee. And I, I actually didn't mind that dynamic. And if we're telling the truth, you and me, it makes it easier. I can explain why, but it, it's actually something that works to your advantage, to my advantage. Um, but but you had the same situation at CNN. Was that proving ground for the White House briefing room? Oh, for sure. I think it was some of the best training I ever had. Because um, when I got to the White House, the one great thing that you have at the podium is you have the microphone right here. And even if people are shouting over you, the microphone is right in front of you and the American people can hear what you're saying. At CNN, you know, I was there during 2016. So this was you know, Trump time. This is when he's running. And it would be eight on one. They did these monster panels and the yeah. host would be as far left as as the panel. Right. And you have directionally eight other microphones that at least three of them are shouting at you. So you you get a sentence and you're lucky if you get a sentence before you are cut <laughs> off unless yeah. it, unless the host like cuts it off. So it was great training to to one avoid the pitfalls. Um, one, you can't play defense. You don't have time to play defense when they ask oh. you a question that's inevitably slanted. You, you can't play defense. You got to go straight to offense. And that's why, you know, what do you I mean? learned from like CNN. tell someone that question is is slanted so, and unfair. Well, for example, um, and I could be wrong here, but to, as I recollect, I don't recall ever being given the topic of Hillary Clinton's emails. It was a huge issue. The FBI put out many statements. I don't remember that ever being a topic we were given. The topic was always, you know, Kazir Khan and Donald Trump or whatever the, you know, the really personal hit was against Trump. Um, you know, the tapes, all the infamous tapes. That was all CNN. So if I wanted any chance to talk about Hillary's emails, it had to come as an offense moment, not mm. finding myself in this hole of talking about Kazir Khan and Donald Trump, but moving to the other candidate, um, talking about the topic that is important for viewers to hear the other candidates' flaws, um, but they would never hear on CNN unless you used your one sentence, not to play defense um, for the former president or at the time the candidate, but to play offense um, and go to the other side of the story that you don't get on CNN. It's never a, a topic of discussion for a segment. So I know exactly what you're talking about of beginning the conversation on defense. My experience at CNN, which predated yours, was before Trump, and it was during Mitt Romney's run for president. And I just remember, and I and I and I I made issue of it. I brought it up that that every segment I do feels like it starts like this. So explain to me how Mitt Romney is not racist. You know, like it was like bingo. <laughs> you know, every segment was like that. So the presumption is he yes. is, and I have to prove the <laughs> negative that he isn't. And this is the literally dozenth time we've done this this week. You know, I mean <laughs> that that was the defense that I was I was always on. Hey, I mentioned I don't know. I want, I'm curious if you agree. In some ways, it works to your advantage. You were on a tighter. If you can only get half a sentence or a sentence out, that's a whole another um, degree of difficulty. What I always found is. If they let three people who all share the same opinion talk and then I get to talk or wherever I fit into the thing, I can actually choose who I want to respond to. I can actually yes. choose which argument that I want to rebut. And, and look, I could choose the weakest if I want or the one I like the best or the one I'm strongest on. It, it's actually counterproductive for them on on, you know, making a case that's impenetrable, except for the whole run out the clock element, you know, four to one on time. But I, I, I found it like. 
it's easier to connect and land punches when you guys throw four sloppy ones. I get to pick the sloppiest and punch right back at that. I think that's exactly right. And inevitably, when there are people of the same opinion um, who are very passionate and often short on facts, I would add, it becomes much of a feeding frenzy and the passion kind of elevates as they're talking about Trump being a racist or xenophobe or whatever the the topic was. And it was actually um, the late Alan Combs, who was a mentor of mine, who comes from the left. We we don't think alike, um, but he became a mentor to me from my time here at Fox as an intern. And he texted me after one of the CNN panels and said, Kaylee, remember, don't fight fire with fire, fight fire with water. And when he said that, it was so wise. And I learned hmm. if I allow Christine Quinn to explode, as she did in this like clip that went viral on CNN of her and I in our argument, if I allow her to explode and I have a calm demeanor and mm. with facts, I present my point of view. I will win the argument just based on demeanor. And it's something I took with me to the podium, thanks to Alan Combs. And it's something that I, I take pride in is one thing Democrats will say to me when I meet them is, I don't agree with what you say, but I like the way you say it. And I listen. You and did a good job. If that's the really answer I get, that. then, then thank you. Well, thank, I could thank Alan Combs for that because he's such <laughs> wise advice. And uh, I took it to CNN and then to the White House. I needed that advice. I have been a fight fire with fire, meaning, okay, I'm going to stay calm. You don't strike me that way. (laughs) Well, it's not, I'm not, I'm not fire right away. But like, if you keep coming at me with a level of fire sooner or later, I'm going to match your level of fire. Like, I think that I am. Listen, I I was on a set with Stephen A. Smith. You can't just throw water all the time. (laughs) That's true. (laughs) You're going to have to light some fires. Otherwise, yes. the, you know, you're going to be drowned out. Um, <laughs> okay, a couple quick predictions before I lose you here today. Um, okay, so you've mentioned this earlier. So let's go back to some of these midterm elections. Your biggest surprise to the positive for Republicans uh, in these midterms? To the positive, um, I think a Republican governor in Oregon and a Republican senator in Washington state. Those are big, bold predictions. I hope they come true, but that could be the surprise of the night. Okay, and your your biggest then concern slash disappointment. I don't want to say surprise because you've probably uh, it may be Pennsylvania, and I can tell you already steeled yourself some for some level of surprise or disappointment. But where where do you think Republicans are going to wake up um, on Wednesday morning and go, man, we lost here? Yeah, you know, I, I mentioned Pennsylvania. I'm concerned, but I think we can pull it off. I, I actually just can't believe the polling, um, as I mentioned. Um, the Kansas gubernatorial race, which I haven't dug too much into, but I saw a poll that was too close for comfort this morning. So I hope that's not the case. But um, Kansas may be one place where I was a little concerned. Okay. And now this one. All right. You mentioned DeSantis. We talked about Kerry Lake. I mean, by the time this conversation airs, we're going to be on the clock until the questions are answered. Who's running for president of the United States? I mean, this is going to happen like in a couple of days in a week. Um, There are people asking this question is, and I think it's Megyn Kelly that has answered it directly in. She does not believe there is a single candidate, including Ron DeSantis, that has a prayer of winning the Republican nomination outside of Donald Trump. If he chooses to run for president, what do you think? Look, I mean, he is a formidable candidate. We saw this in 2016. Uh, The headlines were he'll never run. He ran. The headlines were he'll never win a primary. He won. The headlines were he'd never be a president. He was. Um, I never count President Trump out of the fight. He was a great boss. Um, The economy in our country was strong. Um, I saw this poll with with suburban women today that everyone's been talking about or um, just generally it happened this week um, that there was a swing back towards Republicans. And now it's plus 15 suburban women for Republicans. Well, that same poll showed that just since August, Trump, who was losing among white suburban women to Joe Biden, actually is beating him by quite a substantial amount with this key cohort. Remember, he gained among Latinos. He gained among black Americans. He lost among suburban women and it shows that they've come home. So a uh, long story short, I mm. never count President Trump out. Same time, I have a great governor in Florida, Governor Ron DeSantis. I hear about him wherever I go in the country, California, Nevada. I travel almost every weekend. He's, his name is on everyone's lips. And I think to have two amazing candidates in the race, either one of them who would be remarkable 
presidents. Um, we're very fortunate as a party. Our bench is very deep, and that's just two of many. Um, and you look at the left, and Joe Biden will likely run, um, and he has a cadre of others around him um, that is more like a clown car cadre. Um, and we've got two very formidable people right there at the top of each and every poll. Well, Kaylee, at some point, I'd love to have you on again. I'd love to talk more about your life, your personal life. You're on the verge of um, of having a baby and expanding your family. You and I have talked in private. I don't know how private it is about how you met your husband. And yep. I would um, I <laughs> it's would not love- private on Twitter. But we'll- <laughs> yes, <laughs> there you go. Kaylee met her husband on Twitter. Direct messages, I believe. So yes. There's hope for everyone out there. There's hope. <laughs> uh, uh, but I would love to have you on again and talk at, at greater length about um, what it is that, that that went into making you who you are today. But I really appreciate the time you gave us today to address the midterms. And I think you're really, really fascinating and amazing um, performance in the job of White House Press Secretary. Thank you, Will. Well, this is not a gratuitous compliment. I love watching you on Fox and Friends. You're fantastic. When you fill in on Tucker and your podcast is just top notch, your analysis is uh, one of the the ones where, you know, I want to pause and hear what you have to say and, you know, Blake's screaming, but I want to hear what Will Kane has to say. So thank you so much for having me. (laughs) Thanks, Kaylee. All the best. Thanks. Hey, it's Will Kane. Click here to subscribe to the Fox News channel on YouTube. It's the best way to get our latest interviews and highlights. And click to subscribe to the Will Kane podcast for full episodes right now.